Welcome everyone to our webinar, Using Implementation Fidelity Data to Evaluate and Improve Program Effectiveness. My name is Amber Malinowski and um, I'll be one of your moderators for today's session. Before we get started, if any of you are new to Zoom webinar, I just wanted to put up a quick slide here to help you get oriented. If you are having any trouble with your audio, so if you need to call in by phone, or if you um, can't hear, there's a little mic over on the left, and you can expand that little arrow, and you'll be able to troubleshoot that. You can also send a chat message if you have any questions for me, and I can help you with that. In the middle, you can raise your hand. You can also ask questions, and you can ask technical questions to me, or if you have questions for our presenters today, you can also ask those there, and I'll be moderating those at the end. We are gonna have a couple of polls to get your interaction today, and if you need to leave for any reason, that is on the very far right. We are really excited for our presentation today. Again, my name is Amber Malinowski, and I'm the Director of Content and Communications here at Weave. I'm joined today by Dr. Ray Van Dyke, our Senior Vice President, and our guest presenter, Dr. Sarah Finney of James Madison University. We're so excited to have her with us today. Um, I am going to let uh, Dr. Ray Van Dyke introduce her after I do just a couple of polls with you. So the first one, we want to just get to know you a little bit better. What is your job title or main area of work? So I've launched the poll. You should be able to just go ahead and click in there and vote. If you can't see it, it's likely that it's just in another window or minimized. And then when we're done, I'll also make sure and share those results with you so you know who else is on the session with us today. And I'll leave this open for just another moment. Okay, it looks like most of you are, have almost had a chance to participate in the poll. So with us today, we have 76% of you are assessment professionals, 12% of you are faculty, and then another 12% are student affairs professionals. Welcome everyone. And the next question we wanted to ask you is, what is your experience with implementation fidelity? None, I've heard of it, but never gathered it, or I've gathered implementation fidelity data. Ooh, the voting's a little faster this time. <laughs> uh, people must, must know for sure. Okay, I'll leave it up for just another moment. Oh, this is very, very interesting. I think it will... Uh, help shape the presentation today for sure. Okay, looks like uh, just about everybody's had a chance. I'll leave it up for just another moment. And so 68% on the call have not had any experience with implementation fidelity. 28% have heard of it but not gathered it and 4% have gathered it. So uh, I think that means this is going to be a very useful presentation. Um, so I'll be quiet now and we'll get to the good stuff. Um, Ray, if you want to go ahead and introduce Dr. Finney, I will uh, answer any questions that have come up. Thank you again, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much, Amber. Um, and yes, it's going to be a great webinar and, and it's interesting to see those polls poll results because I think all of you are going to be really pleased to, to um, take part and, and learn from our webinar today. It's a, a real pleasure for me to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Sarah Finney from James Madison University. Um, I've known uh, her work and, and the work at JMU for many years and as probably most of you on the call know, JMU has just an, an amazing assessment program in place. Her, her titles are, she is a professor in the graduate psychology program, and she's also associate director of the Center for Assessment Research Studies, or also known as CARS at JMU. Um, and the really cool thing, one of the many cool things about Sarah and her working, she is actively engaged in, in assessment from the 
perspective of teaching to grad students the, the best practices of assessment and theory behind assessment. And at the same time, she has a role managing uh, programmatic assessment on her campus, um, particularly in student affairs, but also now um, she and I were just talking that that kind of it spreads across for academic and student affairs. Um, in the program, by the way, and many of you again may know this, but JMU is the only institution in the country that offers a PhD program in assessment and measurement. And it's just an excellent, excellent program that I would highly recommend to you. Finally, the last thing I'll say um, about Sarah is the thing that she brings that I'm uh, so appreciative of today is she's very heavily engaged in thinking about how we can be sure that all of our assessment efforts are truly leading to, to learning improvement. Um, and so I, I'm so looking forward to this. Sarah, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And thanks for the plug for our PhD program. Uh, uh, we have uh, many, many uh, wonderful graduates of our program, and I will cite a lot of their work as I go through because I do so much of the work with my, um, with my students. All right, let's get, all right. Okay. So, <clears throat> Um, I went ahead and shared this slide deck with Ray and Amber, so you all will have access to it. Um, go ahead and share it with anyone on your campus or your friends at other campuses. Uh, I think sharing information is really important. Um, and again, please, please do that freely. So as Ray said, when I talk about implementation fidelity today and outcomes assessment, my whole frame is to do that to improve program effectiveness. Um, and I think we have to keep that in mind. And that's kind of how I want to start, is when I talk to anyone about outcomes assessment or more specifically implementation fidelity, I always talk about our goal is to make evidence-based decisions. So when we're on campus, whether we're faculty, or we're student affairs professionals, or we're um, uh, assessment specialists, what we're doing is we're striving for educational excellence. And what I mean by that is if we're working with faculty, they are developing or implementing curriculum or instructional strategies. Our student affairs practitioners are implementing programs or interventions that are adopted with the goal to improve what students know, think, and can do. Um, what we are tasked with as assessment specialists and faculty and student affairs professionals is to see if the anticipated outcomes of our programs, what students know, think, and can do, if those actually occur. And that's usually what we think about when we think of outcomes assessment, gathering that test data or the scores on our non-cognitive measures or our behavioral observations, like thinking about those scores, what's happening. But the larger thing that we need to do, and I would say the more important thing we need to do, is to see if those anticipated benefits, if those outcomes can be, can be tied to or attributed to the program that we created. Because when we do outcomes assessment, it's all about feeding back into informing our thoughts, our claims about the effectiveness of our programs. Okay, so again, all I'm saying here is our intent always with any effectiveness or outcomes assessment work is to investigate if changes occur in the outcome and if those changes are a result of our intervention. And of course, we know that if we fail to engage in this process of outcomes assessment, then we could continue to implement an ineffective program or curriculum, and we don't want to do that for students. They usually get one shot at undergrad and, or graduate school, and we want to make sure our programming is effective. Also, if we don't evaluate the effectiveness of our programming and interventions, we could actually terminate a program that was actually effective. Um, it may get cut. Had we had data to show that it was effective, we could advocate it for it to remain in our academic or student affairs um, programming. So I'm in the southern area, I'm in Virginia, um, in the Shenandoah Valley, Valley in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and SACCOC is our accreditor. 
And if we look at what SAC COC has stated, they want institutions to identify expected outcomes, assess the extent to which uh, the university achieves those outcomes, and they want the university to provide evidence of seeking improvement based on the analysis of that outcomes data. And they want this done for all the degree programs, for the general education areas, and for the academic and student affairs support programs. So that's that's a lot. And what what we need to really focus on when we think about what they're saying here, at least what we focus on at JMU, is they're talking about evidence-based improvements. All right. So they're really aligned with what we're thinking. We want to make evidence-based decisions based on our data. And they're really pushing, let's make evidence-based improvements based on our data. Okay. And how we go about that is we typically employ some kind of outcomes assessment cycle or you, you all may not have a cycle you may have steps or a process but it's something like what you're seeing in front of you where you specify what students should know think and do the student learning outcomes then you create and map theory-based programming to those outcomes so you go in the literature you say if I have the specific outcome how am I going to build an intervention, a curriculum, activities that are going to actually move students on those outcomes? And that takes a lot of time because we want to go to literature and think about what works theoretically and empirically. Then we go out, we select or design instruments that are well aligned with those outcomes. We collect that data. Usually that's what people think about when they think about outcomes assessments, collecting that, that outcomes assessment data. We analyze, we report it, and then ultimately what we're supposed to do is use those results again to make improvements in our programming, so make those database decisions. Okay. The problem is we're not always closing that assessment loop, and we all know uh, Trudy and Charlie's paper, it was really seminal paper on this issue where they were asked for examples from across the nation of ways in which student learning outcomes was used to improve teaching and learning and student service programs on campus and they could only find a few examples of this and they talked about how folks on campus were engaging in the outcomes assessment process they were doing that but they but few used the results to actually change make data-based decisions to change their program and the reason um, that the reasons they put forth why assessment results weren't used for improvement um, in their 2011 paper, I like to pair that with uh, Miralee Bresciani's paper in, in, in 2010. If you haven't read that, it's a great paper because she looked as well at why student affairs practitioners aren't using results for improvement. And I kind of put those two together when I talk about this. And they talk about, well, there's confusion about the purpose and process of outcomes assessment, as you all are aware of not enough time or resources allocated to assessment work. There may be no institutional value or reward for assessment. And there may be a lack of understanding of student learning and development theories so that uh, student affairs practitioners and faculty can actually build, evaluate, and improve their programming. And I agree, all of these are barriers, there's no doubt. But I've worked with uh, people who are not confused at all about the purpose or process and they have time allocated and they have resources allocated to do the work. And I'm at an institution where there's great value placed on outcomes assessment and they are rewarded for that work. And I work with people who uh, uh, engage with the Center for Faculty Innovation, which is our teaching and learning center. So they understand um, student learning development theories to build their program, but still they're not using their outcomes assessment results to improve their program. And I couldn't figure this out at first. And uh, myself and uh, my graduate students dug into this, I'd say, about 10 years ago. And what we um, kept running into was this issue. Um, how do we ask faculty and staff to use outcomes data to improve their curriculum and programming when they actually don't know what's going on in their curriculum and programming? When I first say that, oftentimes people are like, what? You know, your faculty and student affairs practitioners don't know what's going on in their, in their, in their courses or in their programs or in their, uh, the, the courses that span across their major or general education. 
And I would say, yeah, it's, that, 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 that is the case for many programs. And when I talk to people on other campuses or at conferences, it turns out that this is the case for them as well. And a, a lack of knowledge of what students are actually receiving in terms of this educational intervention. If you don't know what's going on on the ground, how do you go about making a change to that thing that's unknown? I, I personally think that's quite impossible. And that's why I started engaging in implementation fidelity assessment. So let's back up again and, rem and, and keep, keep the context of what the heck we're doing here. We typically have a stated outcome that we're interested in, what, what students know, think, can do. We develop a curriculum if we're in student affairs or in um, academic affairs or a program if we're in student affairs. And that is purposefully, intentionally designed with the goal of moving students on that outcome. And usually we get some kind of baseline where students are on that outcome as well. So let me give you an example. At JMU, we went through our quality enhancement plan, our QEP, and we picked ethical reasoning as our main outcome. <clears throat> And so I'm going to give some examples in ethical reasoning because it actually spans across academic and student affairs as well. So it could be that at baseline in, in uh, 2017, we measured ethical reasoning on a 0 to 100 scale, and our students on average scored about a 30. Okay, Not unexpected. They haven't had any ethical reasoning programming. Then a, a year later, at the end of 2018, we tested them again, and they scored an 80. And if we saw something like this uh, occur, our response may be, we have some evidence that the implemented educational program may be effective with respect to increasing students' ability to get, engage in ethical reasoning. And I say maybe here because we don't have a comparison group, much less a control group, so we can't make causal statements. But we have some evidence that, in fact, all of this curriculum programming may be effective. And that's usually followed by discussions with, um, within the people who developed the curriculum, man, I'm glad we spent all that time understanding the theory, underlying ethical reasoning, what is the best instructional practices to promote ethical reasoning. That theory-based curriculum and activities that we created, it may have just worked. And there's usually some celebration around that. But what about this? 30 to 30. Okay, what happens when we see something like this? Then the response is usually shoot or some other word of your choosing. The curriculum or programming doesn't work. That's often the conclusion that people jump to right away. Hmm, doesn't work. Followed by discussions of what a waste of time creating an ineffective curriculum or programming. Now we need to go back to the drawing board, try a different approach, go to a different theory to build that curriculum. Um, major size and, um, and disappointment. And usually if I'm at the table or in the room and this comes up, I say something like, well, hold on a second, hold on, hold on. Maybe it's not that the program that you developed, you spent so long developing that programming, a year or two years, maybe it's not that that program doesn't work. Because in fact, when I see a result like this, a 30 at pretest and a 30 at post test, you know who that result would typically align with? A control group or a comparison group that never got the programming. In fact, that's exactly what I would expect for a group that never got the ethical reasoning uh, uh, curriculum. So let me ask you guys this. Did they actually get the ethical reasoning curriculum or programming? I know we developed it. Okay, I know it was intended to be implemented, but was anyone on the ground making sure that the students experienced the intervention? Because if they didn't, this 30 at pretest and this 30 at post test is exactly what we would expect. And it might be that someone says, yeah, you know, it was implemented. But we heard through the grapevine there were some whispers that it wasn't implemented that well. There was big chunks of it that the students never received. Some of our implementers weren't that great. There were activities that, you know, went over like a lead balloon. It didn't go well. It was incomplete. It was uncoordinated. It was sloppy. So in fact, they did not receive the curriculum, the program that we built that should have worked based on theory. Okay. So here's the rub. If you only go through the outcomes assessment cycle that I showed you, 
you can't pick between these three options. So if you have a pre-test score of 30 and you have a post-test score of 30, you don't know does your program actually not work? That program that's on paper, does it actually not work? Or was it that the program wasn't implemented? Or that it was implemented, but it was implemented poorly? There's no way to choose between these three options and use the assessment results for improvement if you don't have any information about the program itself. Okay. This is what I kept running into on the academic side of the house and the student affairs side of the house. So what I'm going to argue is that we need to infuse implementation fidelity data collection into the outcomes assessment cycle. Now let me just say this. I realize what I'm about to what I'm going to advocate for is collecting more data. And I know there's 60 8% of you on the phone right now that are assessment uh, uh, professionals saying, wow, more data, really, Sarah? Um, how are we going to get that? And our faculty and student affairs folks are going to push back. And that's what I have up here in the, in the text. I want to be, I want to make sure that you all know I'm not out to collect data just to collect data. Uh, there's too much data collected, I think, many times and not used. I want to collect the right data, the data that is going to allow us to take action in terms of improving our programs. And in my experience since 2001, I need data about what the program actually was on the ground in order to close the assessment loop. So yes, it's going to be more data, but I think it's data that will allow us to actually then improve our programs. So what is implementation fidelity? Well, I put this quote up every time I talk about it, um, and I have in almost all the articles that my students and I have written. I love it. It's short, and it's old. Um, the bridge between a promising idea and the impact on our students is implementation, but innovations are seldom implemented as intended. And I think this resonates with all of us. We spend a lot of time making our curriculum and our programs, but that does not mean that they're implemented as intended. And I love this quote again, it's short, it's old, but I was so thrilled to see the next thing um, uh, last year. Uh, uh, Koo and Kinsey uh, made some clear, um, direct statements about implementation fidelity that I'm, I'm hopeful will get implementation fidelity in front of more people. Uh, a recent study questioning the value of high impact practices mistakenly assumes that just making them available suffices. How they are implemented is, cru is crucial, said Ku and Kinsey. I could not agree more. Amen. Thank you for saying that. I'm not going to read all of this because you're going to have these slides in front of you, but the gist of what they were saying is simply offering and labeling an activity as high impact doesn't mean that it actually is. Implementation uh, quality is critical, and that caveat doesn't just apply to high impact practices. It applies to any educational programming on our campus. And I love it that they go on and, and they say, we all know firsthand that some courses and some programs and some services and activities are created and implemented better than others. So they're going to be more or less effective. And we really owe it to our students to ensure that our programming is at the quality that we're promising it's at. And that means that we have to go out and evaluate the implementation fidelity, the quality of that implementation. So I'm really hoping that this push by people who um, are, are, are higher profile, and it's not so old, this, this will get implementation fidelity in front of more people. I was thrilled to see that. So again, what is it? We, again, uh, go into outcomes assessment thinking the program is well designed based on theory and that people know how to implement that program. But we have to make sure that's true, that the programming is well specified and it's understood by the people on the ground that, that are going to implement it. Rarely is that alignment between the planned and the implemented program actually evaluated. So. 
What is implementation fidelity? It's the assessment of the degree to which group leaders deliver an intervention completely and according to protocol. It's the determination of how well a program is being implemented in comparison with the original program design during an efficacy or an effectiveness study, which we engage in all the time on our campuses. It's the extent to which participants, teachers, deliver the intended innovation and whether participants, students, accept or receive or are responsive to the intended services at the level of the treatment strength. So let me begin by saying, because we're going to get into this, and I know many of you have, haven't heard of impl uh, implementation fidelity, and that's really where this is pitched, but let me begin by saying I am not saying anything novel. This is not a new concept. The problem is this concept is hidden under different names for different people on your campus. When you go over to College of Ed, they know this is opportunity to learn. And this is all over K through 12. Uh, teachers have to go through and make sure students have an opportunity to learn before they can be tested. And they have to engage in evidence-based practice when teaching. When you talk to people in higher ed, they might have read um, Peter Yule's work, and he talks about designed versus deliver curriculum. Okay. If you talk to people that do experimental research on your campus, they're going to call this a manipulation check. And if you talk to people on your campus, whether they're practitioners or faculty or clinicians that do behavioral consultation, they're going to call this treatment integrity. It all falls under the umbrella of implementation fidelity. But I think because it's called different names, it makes it harder for people to understand what it is. And you know, the other thing that makes it harder is when you look at what the accreditors want and you, and, and you look at their language, where in there is anything about implementation fidelity? It's not in there explicitly. And I think that means that it often becomes overlooked because it's not pointed out by accreditors. Um, I have presented this at SAC COC, so I do want to say they're open, open to this idea. So what I want to talk to you about is a useful way to talk about implementation fidelity on your campus, whether it's in academic affairs or student affairs. Uh, my grad students and I use this um, black box analogy a lot, and it works really well. Let me say I'm going to start with some basic examples where anyone that you're um, providing the example to is going to be like, duh, of course. Of course you should look at that. Then we'll work up the higher ed examples where you can say, well, we should still look at it here too. It just might not be as obvious, okay? So here's how I lay it out. Basically, what we always talk about is the outcome. What is it that students should know, think, or do? And boy, we spent a lot of time talking about that outcome measure. How are we going to go about measuring it? Do we use a commercial measure? Do we make our own measure? Is it a cognitive measure? Is it a non-cognitive measure? Performance assessment? What's the quality of it? We've got to study it a bunch before we make inferences. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how are we going to operationalize the outcome with the measure? Then once we know that's our outcome, then it's, well, what are we going to do? What's the intervention, the curriculum, the activities? What are we going to do to actually move students on that outcome? Okay. All right. The problem is the actual planned intervention is not the same as the actual intervention that students receive. We always talk about the actual intervention being a black box because oftentimes you don't know what actually occurred with respect to that program. So what I'm going to argue is just like we operationalize the outcome with our outcome measure, let's actually operationalize the intervention with measures of implementation fidelity. Okay, so let's go through a couple examples. So let's say there's a disease that exists and our outcome is that we want to eliminate the presence of the disease. We don't want anyone to have the disease. All right, the good thing is how we can operationalize if someone has a disease or not is just a blood test, super easy, all right? So we don't have any issues there. So uh, several medical researchers and doctors spent a year or two and they came up with this cocktail of drugs that they're gonna prescribe. You have to take four drugs every day for two months. Four drugs every day for two months, all right? So people have the disease, they get this prescription, they go away. Right. Then they come back, and let's say they still have that disease. Does that mean that that cocktail of drugs, that intervention, that prescription that the doctors and researchers came up with is ineffective? 
When I usually say this at a conference, people say, well, no. I say, well, well, why is that? They said, well, they probably didn't take all the pills. Exactly. Exactly. It may be that they took um, four pills for one month instead of two. It could be that they took four pills every other day for two months. And, and so it gets spread out for four months. It could be that maybe one of those four pills was a really big pill and they didn't like swallowing it. So they only took three pills. Well, that wasn't the intervention that was prescribed. All right. So that's probably why it didn't work. And what we have to realize then is that when we take the blood test, the blood tests are evaluating the prescription that was consumed, not the prescription that was prescribed. Because of that, doctors often say, record if you took the pills every day. In fact, if they're doing a study, you usually have to go to a medical facility and they put those drugs in your mouth to make sure you're taking them so that they have high implementation fidelity. Another example that will resonate with everybody is exercise programs. I always say to my students, infomercials that come up on Saturday or Sunday morning are the best examples for outcomes assessment and implementation fidelity, because man, they do it right. So let's say our outcome was becoming more physically fit. And we had to figure out how we're gonna operationalize that. And let's say we have four ways we're gonna do that. Weight, okay, so there should be a change in weight. Um, measurement, so we're gonna measure areas of the body before and after a program. Stamina, so how long you can run on that treadmill before and after the program. And pictures before and after a program. And again, you see these all the time, these outcomes when you watch infomercials. And then they tell you, well, here's what the plan program is. So let's say we had some dietitians and some exercise scientists come together. They work for several years, and they come up with a plan program that should affect becoming more physically fit as operationalized by these four outcomes. They come up with that plan. People go away or they buy this program. And you know what? They can't run any longer on the treadmill, and they don't weigh any less and their measurements are the same, and their pictures look exactly the same, okay? What, what's going on there? Well, what typically people will say is, did you do the full program? Did you exercise every day? Did you do the diets that were prescribed? In fact, some of these really good programs, they will send you a diary where you have to write everything down, and they do that so you make the right attribution at the end of the 60 days or the end of the six months. And the attribution is, my results are a function of this program that I implemented. Not necessarily the program that was on the box or that I saw in the infomercial or that was prescribed. It was the program I actually engaged in. So my outcomes data is tied to that actual program. All right, now let's talk about higher ed. So let's say one of our outcomes was we want to increase the value of civic engagement. I bring this up because this is a big push on our campus here at JMU, um, civic competency and civic engagement. So we want, to, we want students to value civic engagement. So it's not only that they engage in civic activities, they feel it's valuable and they're going to talk about it to other people and get them to engage in it. And how we're going to measure that is two ways. We're going to have them write an essay detailing the importance of civic engagement, and we have a self-report valuation measure. And so faculty got together, this is co-curricular, and they came up, with, came up with a planned curriculum. And this involved, based on the literature on valuation and how to increase value for anything, and literature in uh, civic engagement competency, they came up with a curriculum that was for a semester, and it meant each month a community speaker would come and talk about the importance of civic engagement for their community. Students would engage in a debate where they always had to debate for civic engagement um, against someone debating, uh, uh, basically making the argument against it. They would create video scenarios talking about the importance, and they would post notes on the democracy wall. Okay? That's the plan curriculum. But let's say at the end the students can't articulate the value of civic engagement or their valuation scores don't change. Why is that? Well, maybe we couldn't get those speakers to come this semester. And maybe the debates were an utter failure. People didn't come prepared. So let's say the only thing that happened was the democracy wall. Well, if we saw that there was no change, we know the democracy wall on its own will not result in increased value of, of civic engagement. But we don't want to make the inference that our programming on paper was poor because it actually wasn't implemented. So take that and, and try that on your campus. It's usually really helpful. 
And then after you talk about that, we want to talk about why implementation fidelity is so important. And that's because we're going to couple it with outcomes data. If I talk about implementation fidelity and outcomes data in crude terms, meaning we have high implementation fidelity and low implementation fidelity, it's not usually like that, but let's just make it crude like that. And we have good outcomes assessment results and we have poor out outcome res assessment results. Again, it's not dichotomous like that. It's usually on a continuum, but let's just go with that for now. If that's the case, we have four realities. We have four different scenarios we're in where we can think about what does this mean for our program. But what did I just say? Implementation fidelity results are often not gathered. What that then reduces is two realities, okay, that we sit in with just outcomes assessment data. If we gather the implementation fidelity, we have much more detailed um, statements we can make. So let's blow that out here. If we have high implementation fidelity and high outcomes assessment results, the program we implemented um, was the program that was on paper and the outcomes were met. This is good news. The plan program may be contributing to student learning development. If the implementation fidelity results were low and the outcome uh, results were low, we can't make any claims about the plan program. That's what we have to be careful about. The plan program was never received by the students because it wasn't implemented. Now this program that was implemented doesn't appear to be effective, but we can't make claims about the plan program. If we want to assess the plan program, we have to go back and implement it and look at its effectiveness. Let's say implementation fidelity was high and outcomes results were low. Well, then this means the program was implemented as planned. And when you look at those poor outcomes results, you can't say, oh, we're not seeing great results because it wasn't implemented well. No, 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 no. It was implemented well, okay? It's not working. So we implemented the, the program on paper and we didn't get the results we want. Ah, okay, let's use that information to go back and tweak. Maybe we need to make the program longer or stronger, or maybe it's not going to work for this population, but that's useful information. Let's say the implementation fidelity results were low, but the outcomes assessment results were good. So the program on paper wasn't implemented as planned. So the plan program should not get credited with those good results. Whatever it is that the faculty or student affairs professionals implemented, this deviation of the program, that appears to be working. Okay, maybe that should be adopted then. All right, so how do we go about assessing implementation fidelity? When students and I created this little one pager to help, you can see there's five areas. The first area is program differentiation. By hands down, most important. And this is where the faculty or student affairs professionals lay out the specific aspects of the program. Okay, this is where they laid out, if we do X, Y, and Z, it should result in changes in this outcome. This takes the longest time. Then once we know what those specific features are, we're going to see were they actually implemented. If they weren't, we, don't do, we don't, can't evaluate quality, exposure, or responsiveness. If they were implemented, then we want to know the quality of which they were implemented. And were they implement, implemented for the length of time that was prescribed? And were students responsive to those features? So I'm going to give you a couple examples. If you look up here, this is a leadership development six-week short course. And you can see the, there's objectives over here. You can see here, these are kind of broad, general components of the program and how long they should take. Then you can see that there's specific features associated with each of these components. The, the general component and the specific features, this is that program differentiation where, where you're outlining the curriculum, the activities. Okay? Again, exposure is the plan time. If someone was sitting through this program, they could see, well, actually, did they spend 45 minutes on each of these things or 15 minutes? Were each of these features adhered to, yes or no? If yes, what was the quality? And were students responsive? Here's another one. This one was for a one-day transfer orientation. This fidelity checklist, you're only seeing a part of it. This was created by the Dean of General Education, the Director of Orientation, the Director of Career and Academic Planning, and the Registrar. And this is published with a student, Jerusha Gerstner and I, um, several years ago. Um, so you can pull this article and uh, talks about this process. 
So you can see here, here's an objective that students will know their academic requirements. There's a presentation about general education from the dean. There's a presentation by the registrar. These are the main topics they each cover. And again, it can be rated for, was it actually covered? Was it covered for the amount of time that was um, specified by the program developers? Were students responsive? And what was the quality? And you can see there's non-cognitive things that you can assess as well. Uh, one of the objectives is that as a function of going through transfer orientation, students will have a greater cohesion to the JMU community through these large components that are broken down with more specific features. Here's one um, that I did with Kristen Smith. Kristen Smith is, is an assessment specialist at uh, UNC Greensboro, very talented. Here's two of her articles. Uh, she was a PhD student at JMU, and we did this work together. This was for a 15-week uh, curriculum to impact impact ethical reasoning on our campus. This implementation fidelity checklist was created with seven faculty members teaching in six different areas that included education, justice studies, health studies, science, and philosophy. They sat down over a week, Kristen was leading them through this, and they laid out what their targeted learning improvement um, focus was, and it was to increase ethical reasoning skills. And then they laid out what the general components were and the specific features. Then they each implemented these specific features in their classes. Even though one of their classes may be a geology class that's more lab-based or a large philosophy class um, that's lecture-based, they went through and agreed that these were the things that were going to result in students being better ethical reasoners. And then here's one for a three-hour workshop. I know on some of your campuses there's lots of workshops, trainings, credentialing. This is the one that I use when I do my three-hour implementation fidelity workshops on campuses. And I lay out the general components, specific features, and I go through and make sure that I hit all of those things. So let's talk about that. What is rated and who does the rating? So if you have a curriculum or a program, you can use the implementation fidelity checklist that's created to actually rate the live program. So with respect to the transfer orientation checklist that I put up, I actually, along with my students, went through transfer orientation. We went in undercover and we're transfer students. And we sat through that program and we could tell you exactly where students were gonna fail on the outcome measure because we knew what parts of the programs weren't implemented well. So that's an, ex ex uh, an example of observing the live program. Kristen Smith trained a set of graduate and undergraduate students to sit through that 15, not, not all 15 weeks, but several of the 15 weeks of the ethical reasoning program to evaluate how things were implemented. So that's a combination of the live program with independent auditors. We also advocate that the live program be rated by the facilitators of the program. So when I sat through transfer orientation, I also asked the facilitators to rate how well they were implementing that program, okay? You can also videotape the program. You can look at the program materials. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can get this information. What I want to advocate for, because I know we're going to wrap up here and answer some questions really quick, but what I want to advocate for is that you include faculty and student affairs professionals in creating the implementation fidelity checklist. It lets them all be on the same page regarding what is the intervention curriculum and programming. I want to advocate that you tell them to collect the data, whether they sit through a program or if they're facilitating it, they collect it after they facilitated the program. This results in huge buy-in. When we had faculty and student affairs professionals start gathering implementation data on our campus, boy, were they invested in that outcomes data. Boy, did they want to know if what they did or the activities they facilitated, if those were effective. Because they, were, they knew whether or not they implemented well, and then they wanted to see the effect on student learning and development. So in closing, and then we'll take some questions. I love this quote, outcome-based assessment uses the results of assessment to change and improve how a program, a department, a division, or an institution contributes to student learning. That's difficult, <laughs> it's difficult. And I would say it's impossible if you don't have implementation fidelity. 
If our intended outcomes are not observed, we don't know if it's due to a poorly designed program, a well-designed program that matches theory but the theory's wrong, or a lack of high implementation of the program. If we incorporate implementation fidelity into the cycle, we're going to have more information about the actual program, the actual experiences the students receive. We're gonna be able to then make more valid inferences about program effectiveness. And again, I wanna go back to this quote, an effective assessment program should spend more time and money using data than gathering it. I could not agree more, and I know I'm advocating for gathering more data, but I believe it's this data that's going to help us close the assessment uh, loop. I wanna throw up a few um, articles here. These are applied articles, some in academic affairs, some in student affairs. Um, the, na the names you see up there other than um, Keston, Keston Fulcher and I, those are uh, masters or PhD students that have gone through um, the assessment measurement program at JMU. But these are great articles that pretty much any could, anybody could read on your campus. And um, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to me uh, regarding those. So with that, I know that was pretty quick, but I wanted to make sure we had time for questions um, uh, uh, regarding implementation fidelity, how it fits into the assessment cycle, the checklist, and my experience. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, uh, Amber. Thank you so much. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to your presentation and you are you did, you nailed it right on time. I'm so impressed. But there were so many great things in there and we, the questions are coming in. So I'm going to share my screen. Great. And put these up here. So the first question, where do you feel the responsibility for implementation fidelity falls? Yeah, I, I think it falls with the program, um, uh, whether it's an academic program or a student affairs program. Uh, I think it, it, that responsibility is on the people who created and are implementing the program. Uh, I have been involved in these efforts uh, because people didn't really quite know how to use the data once it was gathered or how to gather the data, but I really believe it's it's the responsibility of those creating um, and implementing the program. And for the second question, how do you handle situations where programs or interventions are popular or well publicized but not effective or well implemented? Oh yeah, well we have many of those on our campus. <laughs> um, um, I usually ask them does your program work? Is it effective? And see the response to that. And if they say it's effective, um, I'll ask, well, what evidence do we have for that? Because I'd like to go out and talk about how your program is effective. Do we have evidence of, of students knowing more or being able to do more things? And could you tell me what those are so I could publicize those? And, and usually it's through those conversations we begin to maybe uncover, we don't really know if it's effective or not. Um, we don't really have that data. In, and if that's the case, then we have begin a conversation about, well, how do we go about getting it, the data with respect to if, it's, if it is effective? It, if it's not implemented well, and they know it's not implemented well, then I sit down and have a very pointed, serious conversation to say, let's stop collecting outcomes assessment data. I, don't, I, I think it's a, an epic waste of resources to collect outcomes data for a program that's not implemented well. Let's get that figured out first, because if we gather the outcomes data, it's not gonna be useful if, it's not, if the program isn't being implemented. In fact, I tell people, while you're working on creating or finding your outcomes measure, why don't you go through an implementation fidelity check and make sure your program's being implemented well? Because if we gather outcomes data and we find out our program wasn't implemented well, we can't do much with it. Lots of questions coming in. This is so sure. exciting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what kinds of times and resources are needed? We have an assessment office of one at yeah. a large public university. We think this is important, but I'm not sure how to start. Great question. I think, first of all, have a conversation about do faculty and student affairs professionals know what is going on on the ground uh, and make uh, make someone say that out loud if, if they don't. And that, that really opens a lot of doors. You know, no, we're actually not really sure what is covered in those classes. We're not sure if there is continuity between these courses, that if students did actually 
receive training in this area in course A to get ready for course B. Well, we should probably check on that and make sure the curriculum is being implemented so students have an opportunity to learn. In student affairs, I talk to people in, in residence life or career and academic planning, and they'll, they'll say, I'm not really sure what programming the RAs are implementing. We asked them to do this, but I'm not really sure if it's happening. Well, think about how you can go about doing that. And usually, I don't want to say it's deputizing people, but it's figuring out who, I think about in student affairs, who could be in charge of um, identifying people who could maybe sit through a program or sit down and create a fidelity checklist that the facilitators could then complete. I am really, really um, passionate about facilitators completing the, the checklist themselves because it keeps them accountable. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a little bit to get going on this. Um, I, I was doing this on my own for a while uh, with programs and it, it does take resources. I'm not going to say it doesn't, it does. <clears throat> And I just refreshed here. Hopefully you can all see this. Um, lots of thank yous uh, for presenting and, and taking questions. How does this work impact or influence curriculum design and mapping efforts? Hugely, hugely. Um, in fact, when I um, go through this process, um, whether it's on the academic side of the house or the student affairs side of the house, it is that that the faculty and student affairs people say, wow, this was so amazing just for curriculum design and for mapping the curriculum to the outcomes. When Kristen Smith um, uh, did the workshop with the folks the, for the ethical reasoning programming. Wow, were those faculty thrilled to sit down and say, man, I had a week to think about what is the curriculum, what are the innovations or activities that should work to impact actual ethical reasoning skills, and they got to build that curriculum and map it to the outcomes. It's, it's huge, um, and, and same goes in student affairs. Uh, uh, in, in, it could be, too, that you've got folks in your teaching and learning center or your faculty development center or faculty the Innovation Center that also do this. And if you can team up with them, that would be great. What do you do when faculty or staff react defensively to the idea of collecting implementation fidelity data, particularly if they're not really on board with assessment to begin with? I back off. I'm going to be honest. I, I, I work with the people that come to me. Um, I've tried that. I, I've tried um, going to those folks and uh, where I am right now in my career, and maybe this isn't the answer I should be giving, but I'm going to be really honest. Where I am in my career is I have so many people who really want to know if their curriculum, their, their programming, their innovations are effective and they want to work with me. I don't have enough time in the day to work with them. I'm not going to go out and try to convince someone that I, I, I know I'm not going to convince during their, their tenure or their time here. Um, so I don't do it anymore, and I work with the people who really are interested in, in, in program effectiveness and making improvements. Where do you start when it comes to assess, assessing the implementation of a new curriculum, one that's going to begin in the fall? Um, I, if, if, you, uh, if you can wait on collecting outcomes data, I always advocate for that, and I say focus on implementation. So if it's a new program, a, a new major, something in gen ed, something in student affairs, and it's just laid out, they laid out the curriculum, they're going to implement it, I say, let's spend this first year making sure the facilitators, instructors can actually implement it. You may not have budgeted enough time to get this program through. You, you know, they may need more resources. They actually may not have been trained well enough to implement it. Let's figure that out this year before we calculate or before we collect outcomes data. So I try to push for it for implementation fidelity the first year now if you're at a place where they want outcomes data the first year and you've got to get it then go ahead and get it but gather that implementation fidelity so you know what um, program that outcome data outcomes data refers to that's really critical with a new program when you get the outcomes data you always have to say the data aligns with the program that's on the ground don't necessarily show them the program on paper you have to describe the program the kids actually got and the only way to do that is to get that implementation fidelity and the first time for a new program the program on the ground may not <laughs> resemble much or might may not look a lot like the program that was uh, designed that's program on paper. Great, I'm going to 
jump in and, and ask some some of these questions too. This is great, um, Sarah. So yeah. this one is um, about community college. What do you suggest to use for community colleges? Um, can use this just uh, outside of career tech programs and also a question, there've been a couple of questions about how um, implementation fidelity would relate to general education. Yeah, I honestly, I think this spans uh, uh, two-year colleges, four-year colleges, gen ed, student affairs, major programs. In fact, I consult with a uh, educational effectiveness company, and they um, have me on board to talk about how implementation fidelity is used for uh, technology and new technological advances that are, are being used. Um, uh, essentially, I, I think this model can work in any of those contexts. You just have to have a group of faculty or student affairs professionals that are invested in actually evaluating uh, is the curriculum innovation programming that I created is it actually being implemented on, or in, yeah, actually being implemented on the ground? But yeah, it's, it's definitely transferable. Very good. Um, and uh, this is a good question. How do you ensure that you're getting accurate implementation fidelity data? In other words, that that people are really not um, just checking off, but actually are are giving um, the right answers. Yeah, great question. In a longer talk I give, I actually took those slides out just to make time today. In a longer talk I give, um, if you're worried about that, you're going to want auditors or someone going in to collect the data. And I know that's very resource heavy. What we found at, at JMU was that the auditors' uh, ratings of implementation fidelity and the faculty or facilitators' ratings of implementation fidelity were almost always perfectly aligned. And because of that, I've kind of backed off on sitting through uh, programs as an independent auditor because the faculty and staff have been doing such a good uh, job evaluating if they're actually implementing their program. Now again, I'm working with people who are very invested in knowing what program am I actually delivering so when I get my outcomes data, I know to describe those outcomes with respect to that program I'm actually giving. So they're very invested in knowing what's actually happening. If you feel like you have faculty that are going to say, well, I did all these things and they didn't really do them, yeah, that, that's, that's going to be problematic, but I don't know if they would come to play ball with you to begin with if, if that's the case. Good point. Then we have that question that comes up so often as we do our assessment work, and that's faculty and their curriculum and having, you know, very personal sentiments about it. How, yep. how do we reshape the idea so that they don't see this as a personal evaluation? Yeah, academic freedom always comes up, right? right. So that's why I love, um, like in the ethical reasoning example, let me, um, oh, I don't know if you guys can see my screen. Um, in the ethical reasoning example, um, those uh, seven faculty came together over a week. They developed that curriculum together. They all agreed on it. They came up with the learning activities. Yeah, those activities uh, had different case studies or context depending on if the faculty was teaching in College of Ed versus geology or philosophy, but they came up with that curriculum that would apply across those domains that they could implement. Um, so they never felt their academic freedom was being um, impinged on, they, they were invested. So I think having faculty engage in creating the fidelity checklist really facilitates buy-in. <clears throat> Very good. Um, so we're, we're kind of running up on the hour, so let's try to do a couple more quickly. And then any questions that we don't have a chance to get to here, Sarah, are you okay to maybe take time to respond and we can send them out to folks later? You bet. Okay, great. So I love this question too about this work becoming part of an academic unit's yearly program assessment report. Um, recommendations for how to make such a request to departments that already feel like assessment work is a lot. Yeah, I, I love that. Oh, I, I, I love that idea. I think ask yourself, do you have to gather the outcomes data every single year? And if you don't, then maybe alternate implementation fidelity um, reports with outcomes reports. Um, again, I think we gather all this outcomes data and we don't use it necessarily. And I, and I, I, do we need it every year? Do we have to collect it every semester? Could we instead gather different data for a year that 
gives us a better insight into what's going on with our programs. Um, that's what I would recommend is if you could alternate what type of data you're collecting. Um, I think once, here's my experience, once people start doing implementation fidelity, they want to do it all the time. It turns into, right. they really love it. And then it's like, well, hold on, let's, let's, take a break from it. It seems like we're implementing things well. I think if you did it for a couple years, uh, the programs did, they would, they'd be on board. Very good. And then that kind of leads into the next one, which I also love. And that's, you know, besides the yearly program assessment report, the program review process, it seems like this would be a natural fit. Oh my gosh, yes. So in talking to some folks at Assessment Institute that um, have backgrounds as program evaluators, and I'm sure there's some program evaluators on the line right now, they're thinking, well, yeah, duh, implementation fidelity, of course you're going to do that. As part of any kind of evaluation you would do, you would, you would evaluate the implementation of the program. It, this is a no-brainer for program review, reviews in my mind. And I of, often would scratch my head and say, you know, why didn't I think about this back in 2001? Why? It's so obvious now that this should be part of the program review. Very good. Okay, Amber, I think I, I will let you make the decision, but maybe we'll um, pull back at this point. And then, as I said, we'll have Sarah respond to these other questions. And when uh, we um, send out the um, PowerPoint, we can also give her responses to these questions. Absolutely. We had so many wonderful, engaging questions. Um, I know it was a lot to cover in, <laughs> in less than an hour. You did so great. It's, uh, <laughs> it gave me all kinds of ideas. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you so much. I of just course. can't thank you enough. I hope it was uh, fun to share with this wonderful audience. Um, we've gotten lots of thank yous and compliments as well. Uh, so thank you so much, Sarah. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Ray, for, I don't think I've ever had that many questions. <laughs> I was uh, having a little trouble keeping on top of them. That was great. That's a good yeah. problem to have. I love yeah, yeah, no problem. And, and, and Sarah, thanks uh, again. I've, a, a lot of the comments that are coming in, you did such a great job of kind of, you know, talking theory, but also giving just really specific examples that people could use on campus. So thank you so much for, for doing this for us. You bet. And for those of you out there who are going to ACPA next week, I have three papers there that are on similar topics, program theory, implementation fidelity. And um, I might be presenting on this topic at AALHE. I'm not sure yet. I haven't heard back, but this summer in, um, in Minneapolis. So I might see you there as well. But of course, feel free to email me and take a look at some of those articles. I, I think they're, um, they're very helpful. And, and share. Please share the PowerPoint with your colleagues. That's one of the best things about this community is how, how willing everyone is to share and not reinvent the wheel, but make the wheel better. <laughs> right, exactly. It's, it's a group effort. Um, for those of you who are still hanging out with us, um, this has been recorded and it will, you'll get a link to that recording. Usually I email that out the next day after I make sure everything is ready to go. Um, and then it'll also live in our Knowledge Center. So if you want to go to weaveducation.com, there's a place with webinars and other resources. It'll live there. Um, there's also going to be, if you wanted the slides, I have those and so those will also be in that email and with the recording um, and and as Ray said the answers to the questions as well we also there will be a survey that comes up once you leave the webinar and sometimes it comes up in its own browser window other times it'll be something from zoom that says do you want to leave zoom uh, you can go ahead and say yes it's nothing scary it's just a survey uh, it helps us shape what kinds of webinars and other resources that we offer so we would love to hear your feedback on things that you're working on things that you need help with and so if you could take the survey we'd really appreciate it our next webinar is in a little uh, over a week it'll be on the 7th and this is going to be by Lindsay Gwynn of Washington and Jefferson College she is a repeat webinar presenter for us we're really excited to have her back for what I think is her third webinar and this will be on best practices for effective administrative assessment so I'll put a link to that webinar in the email as well in case you want to sign up or share that with anybody for the next minute, I swear I'm going to be really fast. Um, if you would like to know more about Weave, that's what I'm going to talk about now. I promise I won't take too much of your time. Um, Weave was created in 2003 at Virginia Commonwealth University. And so we've been doing this for a while. It was to help them address a lot of the issues that we're talking about today, the challenges of, of institutional effectiveness work. We became a company in 2006. And 
most of our team come, comes from institutions. Ray and I are both from, from large four-year institutions. We also have people who've worked at private colleges and community colleges. We have lots of different people on our team that help shape our solutions. And we are really, really excited to be able to help lots of schools do this important work. WEAVE is actually an acronym for the assessment process. For those of you who maybe didn't know that, oh, I get that question a lot, what does WEAVE mean? It is the one that VCU uses for their assessment process. We have software solutions. We offer these lovely webinars and checklists and um, eBooks and things like that. We also um, we have some people on our staff who do consulting and offer those types of solutions. And if there's one thing we've learned after working with literally hundreds and hundreds of institutions is that it's important that any solution, software or otherwise, be flexible so that we can assist lots of different types of institutions and individual units within those institutions, and that we try and simplify this work and I think that's one of my favorite things about the presentation today is it had practical application of making this easier and more actionable and that's something that's really important to us here at Weave. These are the different types of things that we can help you with. Um, pretty much all things IE related, assessment, accreditation, credentials management, program review, and strategic planning. Um, those are all things that we have knowledge in and solutions for. And we also have that Knowledge Center. Uh, you just go to our website, weaveeducation.com, and then you go over to Knowledge Center, and all of those are available for free to anyone. We really like to participate with this community in providing these resources. We also have a toolkit area that is specifically for institutions to provide to their faculty and staff so that they don't have to go to our website. If you have questions about that, just let me know. Um, and if you do decide you want to learn more, um, you know, you just let us know, and we have lots of different ways that we customize this process for people. Um, we really want it to be something that fits our institution. So if you would like to learn more, um, I've launched a quick poll. If you'd like to learn more about our solutions, just respond yes. If not right now, that's perfectly okay too. Um, just wanted to make sure we gave people that option. And again, if you wouldn't mind taking the survey, that would be so wonderful. Um, and if you want to learn more about our resources, you just go over to the Knowledge Center and you can scroll down here. Um, our Upcoming webinars will be here at the top and you can register for those. And we've got webinars on focus groups, um, assessment 101, um, student affairs. I mean, there's just all kinds of great stuff in here and you can watch any of these just by clicking the link and then you'll be able to get to the recording. Um, again, my name is Amber and thank you so much, um, Sarah and Ray and everyone for being on the call today. It was a wonderful session and I will be sending the recording and all of the other things that were promised um, after I get it all processed, it takes me about one day, and I'll send that out in an email tomorrow. If you have any questions in the meantime, it's amber at weaveeducation.com. And thank you, everybody, so much. Thank you, uh, Sarah and Ray. Again, this was wonderful. Everybody have a great day.